Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, my name is Becky Bespertwistle. I'm the Conservation Engagement Coordinator at CPAWS Southern Alberta. And I'm really happy to see so many of you logging on um, tonight to join us. Uh, yeah, if you could just next slide, please. Yeah, so these are our panelists, as you've probably seen. Um, next slide. And yeah, we're, uh, CPAWS Southern Alberta, just a little bit about us. Um, we're a nationwide conservation organization. We've been, uh, the chapter has been active in Southern Alberta since 1967. Um, in Southern Alberta, we've been involved in the creation of the Elbow Sheep uh, Parks, the Bow Valley, the Bob Creek Wildlands, and the Black uh, Creek Heritage Rangeland, and more recently, the Castle Wildland and Provincial Parks. We're also heavily involved in land use planning in Alberta, including input into the development of the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, which you might hear about tonight, and resulting sub-regional plans that manage roads and trails and create comprehensive recreation plan for Southwest Alberta. Um, just a little bit of tech housekeeping. Next slide. Uh, we will be taking um, questions after the panelists present. So you can use the Q&A function at any time. Um, just drop your question in there and uh, we will be um, sorting them and passing them on to Catherine, who's our moderator. We're also going to be recording everything tonight and emailing it out to everyone registered, so you don't have to do any frantic note taking. It will be available for reference later. Yeah, and with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, Dr. Catherine McGowan. Catherine is an assistant professor in the Bissett School of Business at Mount Royal University. She currently teaches courses regarding history and social innovation and has research topics including truth and reconciliation, climate change, women's rights, and social innovation. And she will be our guide this evening. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Becky. Um, I just want to start by saying that at least I'm coming to you from the traditional territories of the Nisitsipi or Blackfoot peoples of Treaty 7 uh, in southern Alberta, which includes the Sitsuga, Pigani, Kanai, and Sitana and Stony Nakoda First Nations. Uh, Calgary or Mokinstis is also the home of Métis Nation Alberta Region 3, and we are deeply thankful for um, being so welcomed in this space. So we are gathered tonight for what I suspect will be an incredibly interesting conversation about coal in Southwest Alberta. It's not an area that I claim a significant expertise in, but I am deeply excited about the opportunity to learn from our four panelists. And in particular, I think this conversation is really critical uh, at a time like now. It's very easy to be distracted with the news of the day and the very real concerns that are in front of us. But this is also a time to be planning for the future and learning from the past. And so the opportunity to engage with the kind of conversation we will have this evening will be absolutely fundamental to making sure that our province and our country more broadly is able to bounce forward out of this crisis into something that is resilient for the future for as many people as possible. So I'm deeply, deeply honored that I was asked to moderate tonight and I am very excited about the possibility of learning something from the four panelists that we will be introducing with you to tonight. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our first panelist, uh, Katie Morrison of CPAWS. Katie is a professional biologist who has been working in the environmental sector for almost 20 years. She holds a BSc in Environmental and Conservation Sciences from the University of Alberta and a Master's of Environmental Design from the University of Calgary. Katie has worked in Canada and Latin America for university research projects, non-governmental organizations, and environmental consulting companies. She has an in-depth understanding of conservation, ecology, stakeholder consultation, and mitigating the environmental impacts of human development. Katie's academic and professional experiences allow her to work on designing adaptive management solutions towards achieving landscape conservation and healthy communities in southern Alberta. Katie spends her free time gardening, fishing, creating textile art, traveling, and exploring wild places with her dog, as seen in this lovely photo. So I'm going to pass things over to Katie. I uh, can't wait to see sort of what she brings to us tonight. Great, thank you. Um, um, I think this is one of the, the, the reactions I get when people hear about new coal developments in Southern Alberta. And, and I, um, 
just want to walk through tonight sort of how we got here, what, what is happening as far as coal in Southern Alberta, um, and a little bit about what we and others can do, and I'm sure all the other panelists will, will talk about that as well. Do you want to go to the next slide, please? So, since 1976, in Alberta, we had what was called um, the, a coal development policy for Alberta, or the coal policy. And this policy, when it was written, really guided coal development, including things like royalties, benefits, um, conditions, and authorizations. It included land use zoning um, on what areas were and were not appropriate for coal, or what areas were you needed to pay extra special attention to because of their environmental sensitivity. Um, and this was created with extensive public consultation in the 70s to create that fair balance between environmental protections, economic development, and the social needs of Albertans. Um, and this coal policy was rescinded or canceled this year uh, on June 1st without any public consultation. Although we know from some documents that um, for at least seven months before they rescinded this, this policy, the government was having conversation with coal companies um, who were looking to develop in some of these off-limits areas. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned the, the land use zoning in the coal policy, um, and there were four zones or categories as part of this policy. Category one, which, which prohibited all ex coal exploration or development, um, and that was, um, so it was completely off limits, and the government has said that they will continue to respect this, this zone, um, but we're still looking into what legal um, matter they have for, for protecting um, category one, because uh, the notation they put on it is not actually legal, um, or it's not, it's not a legislative protection, it is, it is legal. Um, <laughs> um, and then category two, limited um, exploration to under strict control, um, and development in this area, coal mines was, could only be underground or in situ mines. So there could be no open pit mining in this category two, which is that sort of blue area that you can see uh, in the map. Uh, and this is about 1.5 million hectares. Um, and then categories three and four uh, allowed some uh, exploration and some development. And these were largely areas that had coal activity prior to the development of the coal policy. Um, and so they were allowed to continue to have, to have coal. Uh, and the area that, that is most affected is that category two. I think you can go to the next slide here. Um, yeah, so it's the category two that um, has the most impact of the rescission of the coal policy. So this is the area that what coal, open pit coal mines were not allowed before and are now allowed. Um, and this area is also, as you can see in the highlighted areas, some of our most important source water regions for the province. Um, so I just want to remind people, so um, I talk about it being source water, and I think that is one of the most important and most valued um, uh, values of this area. It, it literally provides uh, the majority of the water in the 80-90% to not just Southern Alberta or, or Central Alberta in the case of um, Bighorn and Edmonton's headwaters, um, but all across the prairies, you know, the North Saskatchewan and South Saskatchewan systems provide most of the water for the three prairie provinces. Uh, it's really important foothills, grassland, and montane forest ecosystems, which I'm sure um, uh, folks will talk about as well. It's habitat for species at risk, including some of our native trout species that are listed uh, federally grizzly bear, bighorn sheep, mountain goat. It's really high importance for connectivity so that those, um, those species, other processes um, can move across the landscape. It has high recreation value. I know this is a place that a lot of us go, and including myself, for um, fishing and hiking and hunting and camping. And it also supports local communities and economies, including ranching, agriculture, and recreation, which I think other panels will also touch on. Next slide, please. Um, and you can just sort of go through the next three here. Just for folks who aren't familiar with the area, these are just a few photos um, that, from the area that show its natural beauty, its importance, um, and its value for, for some of these uh, environmental and social values. And this beauty and importance of 
of this region and particularly this the southwest west which we'll talk more about um, is already helping establish uh, southwest alberta as a leading international destination it was recently named uh, in the global top 100 sustainable destinations and a finalist uh, for best in america's award for the 2020 green destinations award um, receiving accolades is a place among global destinations that strive to be more sustainable for the benefit of travelers and local communities and to preserve, enhance, and celebrate our iconic character of place. Next slide, please. So, you know, this, this area is, is, is so important for so many things. Um, and since the cancellation of the coal policy, we've seen Australian mining comp companies have quickly moved in and are actively building hundreds of kilometers of roads, drilling coal test pits, um, applying for mine approvals in these ecologically sensitive Rocky Mountain regions. Um, and the majority of that is in, in this zone two that previously was protected and is now is not. So if you can see on the map there, um, the two dark red areas, those are uh, Grassy Mountain in, in the southeast um, and Tent Mountain in the southwest. And those two are at their basically final stages of approval. Grassy Mountain just finished its hearing, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Tent Mountain, um, I'm still actually not completely clear on, on what the process is, but uh, Tent Mountain was a legacy mine. They never officially closed the mine, even though they haven't actually mined there for 30 years. Um, so my understanding is they don't have to go through the full process to reopen that mine. They just have to sort of renew their permits um, and do, uh, do some application, but it's much, much, much less than, than a full environmental assessment and a full uh, application process. The areas in the sort of middle pink, um, those are areas that have ex exploration permits now. So those are the areas that companies are out um, exploring, drilling those holes, building those roads. Um, and in the north, that big blob is, is Cabin Ridge and a company called Elan. Um, and then the smaller blobs are um, Montem. Uh, and then the rest of the light pink is area that those those companies already on the landscape are are talking about openly that they intend to move forward um, with exploration and potential mines in those lighter pink areas as well. So that's about right now about 38,000 hectares of exploration um, permits or under exploration permit uh, and addition or or project application. An additional 32,800 hectares, roughly, um, of planned exploration in this region. And if you go to the next slide. Um, they also opened last week for tender uh, coal sales for new leases in the region, which is the yellow. So about another 2,000 hectares of, of lease that is now open for application for, for other companies to buy that lease um, and, and explore or, or put in mine applications. Next slide, please. So talking about coal mining, talking about open pit coal mining, what exactly is that? What is an open pit coal mine and what does that look like? So in our case, what happens first is companies obtain these exploration permits, um, which is building those roads, drilling those test pits, using stream water for drilling often. Um, and this all happens or can happen before um, an environmental impact assessment is even started, um, and in some cases before the lease is even obtained uh, by the company for this region. So a lot goes into the to um, changing the landscape before any kind of real depth in depth uh, impact assessment is done. Once that, uh, no, yep, thanks. <laughs> um, no, if you can go back. W um, so once the mine is. Uh, goes through the, the application, the environmental assessment process hearing, and is approved. Essentially, explosives and machinery are used to um, reach the, the coal deposits, for in the, which are in those seams throughout the mountain. Um, and that means removing all the ore burden, all the rock um, and, and waste and soil. Um, not that rock or, or, or soil are actually waste, they're actually very valuable. Um, but they remove all of that to get to those coal seams. Uh, and that creates a lot of this, this waste rock, which is piled often in adjacent valleys or in adjacent um, mountain areas. Um, and then water is used to wash the coal. So it's a pretty water intensive process, which I think um, Rachel and others will be talking about later as well. 
Um, and that water is essentially then put into uh, sediment ponds where the, the, the heavy metals and the selenium and, and, and toxic elements are meant to settle out and that water is released. So essentially mountains come down, valleys often come up, and we are left with um, toxic tailings ponds essentially. Next slide. Um, and that's just an example. This is in the Elk Valley right across the uh, border uh, or across the divide um, of what that looks like um, after, after it's done. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so this has a lot of environmental impacts and I won't go through all of these in, in detail because they told me I didn't have enough time. Um, but essentially, you, you know, we, we could see decreased water quantity um, for, for the ecosystem and also for other users in the basin, decreased wa water quality. Selenium is a major issue um, for uh, coal mining. Uh, selenium is a natural element that is released uh, from the coal when it's exposed to water and oxygen. So when it's mined, or the coal uh, and surrounding rock. And this has massive uh, it impacts on, on fish um, and potentially human health concerns and is a real issue in almost all coal mines in North America. Um, and once it's in the system, we've actually never seen a coal mine be able to manage that um, selenium issue uh, once it's released. It also, we see you know, loss of habitat and connectivity, um, both at the exploration stage and the mine development stage. We know coal is a, is a major greenhouse gas, gas um, but it also the disturbance of this landscape of these huge footprints have a landscape impact um, for climate, which I'm sure uh, folks will be talking about. And then human health impacts. Um, there are studies in, in the US in coal mining regions where um, a whole list of health impacts are coming out in communities, not just the miners, but in communities close to uh, coal mines. Next slide, please. So all of this, as I talked about, is happening in our headwaters. Um, and particularly when we talked about the selenium issue and, and, and tech across the border in BC, um, tech has literally spent billions of dollars over many years to try and get an issue or to get a handle on this selenium issue. Um, but, despite, but despite community water supplies being contaminated, um, and undrinkable by, by some local communities. Fish have high levels of deformities. Uh, recently, there was a population collapse downstream of 90% of fish um, population collapsed. So, but, and they've never been, to get, been able to get a handle on it. I think this is almost inevitably the future of downstream, uh, of new, uh, the future of downstream communities and downstream water supplies uh, in, in Alberta. Next slide, please. And the government all recently also made this kind of worse. Um, you might have heard in the news that the government now is trying to change the water allocation policy in the Southwest Basin to allow coal mines to go forward. Essentially, the South Saskatchewan Basin um, has been closed to new water allocations for, for quite a while because water is scarce um, and there's a high demand for different water users. So these rules were put in place to conserve water, make sure people had fair access to water, and created a market system uh, for water allocation. With what they're doing now, um, they are trying to open that up to open a huge amount of allocations in the um, green upper headwaters uh, region um, for industrial use, essentially to facilitate these mines. We talked about the mines needing a lot of water, Right now, there are not the water licenses available to them. So what they're trying to do is, is open up and, and change the, the water allocation to allow that. We know that um, Benga for the Grassy Mountain Mine has their licenses for about 450 acre feet um, of water. But Atrium, Montem and Cabin Ridge um, all combined are looking at about another 3,000 or a bit more than 3,000 acre feet um, of water. Um, and that's um, about 840 Olympic-sized swimming pools of, of water that they're looking for. Next slide, please. 
And as I mentioned, this isn't just a future scenario um, if the mines are approved and built. Right now, we're seeing that exploration um, happening on the ground. We're seeing the habitat fragmentation um, of the roads and the, and the disturbance of the drill pits. Um, we know that road density is an indicator for grizzly bear mortality, sediment into creeks and streams, which is for trout, um, a major issue, general water quality. Um, and this year, actually, Atrium Coal was twice approved to conduct these exploration activities in goat and sheep habitat during the restricted activity window put in place to protect these species um, during their sensitive times of year. And they were both they were approved twice to be able to drill within those, those areas during that time. Uh, and this is before an EA has ever happened. So we're really seeing this going forward now, not in the future. Next slide, please. Another thing that's brought up a lot um, because these two announcements were made kind of within a couple months of each other is um, the parks delisting. And so whether by coincidence or design, I don't know that the government actually sat down and said, let's delist these parks so we can build coal. But we do know that 60 of these parks are within areas now open for coal mining. Um, and I think that indicates a really concerning move for valuing these outdoor spaces as places for wildlife and for people to managing them for their non-renewable -re non resource value alone. And you can see in the south, that area that we've been talking about, um, there's five, and actually, if you count the new leases that were put up for tender, those six um, PRAs in the south that I know are super valuable to folks who use those areas, um, particularly you know, anglers um, and, and motorized users as well, um, that they're pretty much smack dab surrounded by exploration or, or leasing. So, you know, whether the parks are, are purposely being delisted for coal, um, I think these ones are definitely at risk because they are surrounded uh, by coal. Next slide, please. Um, so who benefits and, and you know, this sounds like a crazy idea. Um, so who is benefiting from this? And as I mentioned, we, we are seeing it's almost entirely um, Australian mining companies, um, uh, uh, some owned by some of Australia's richest billionaires who are coming in uh, to exploit this resource. And once the coal is out of the ground, it's, it's largely exported to Asian markets, meaning most of the economic value is flowing out of Alberta and out of Canada, all the while undermining existing and growing sustainable economies, affecting the livelihood of ranchers, outfitters, outdoor recreation industry, and other land users. Next slide, please. So I think you know, we're really at a crossroads for this landscape and for our province, um, I think. You know, we as Alberta voters and citizens really have the largest stake and the biggest voice in whether Going forward, our public lands are managed for a long-term sustainable economies, a clean environment, and healthy communities, or for another short-term economic boom with long-lasting and far-reaching Slide, please. So we've been actively involved in this for that reason. And one of the, one of the things that we have been working on, how's my time, sorry. <laughs> You're a little over, but we okay. talked about this. So. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we've been doing, and I know some of the other folks in line have been engaged in, is the is the hearing for the Grassy Mountain. Um, that just ended uh, um, beginning of December last week, I think, week four. Um, and final statements by all the interveners and all the parties will be made mid uh, January. The panel then takes away all the information and evidence they've heard, and they will come back in June to make a recommendation to the federal minister and to the province on whether the mine should be approved. Um, after that point, the, the federal cabinet will make the actual decision. So there should also be another public comment period that we'll be sure, um, making sure folks are engaged in. And then the federal minister, essentially, and cabinet likely, um, will we'll be the one who gets to decide or who decides whether this project should move forward and if it does on what conditions. So I think one of the things with Grassy is that um, it is not just the single mine 
because that because of this coal policy rescission, um, Grassy Mountain is really the the first in the domino of mines. If Grassy is approved, it makes it much more likely that all of the rest of these um, mines will move forward, um, and and we'll see just a, the significant change in the landscape. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that happened that I think uh, Rachel will talk more about is that uh, some of the ranching folks have um, filed this, a judicial review of the, of the rescission of the coal policy. And um, a bunch of groups like CPAWS and others um, are intervening in support of this application, but I'll let them talk more about that. Next slide. But I think it is gonna take everyone. It's going to take everyone involved to stop these mines and it affects all of us. You know, ranchers, landowners, uh, indigenous people, recreation organizations, hunters, anglers, businesses, outfitters, scientists, all of us um, should be engaged in this conversation um, and, and are really needed to be engaged in this conversation if we're going to stop um, this flood of mining. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are the two websites from the CPAWS perspective and I think they're shown again at the end um, to get more information and to um, take action writing um, write to your MLAs and your MPs and, and get involved. So I'll pass it back to Catherine for the next panelist. Thank you, Katie. I'm doing a terrible job of moderating, moderating, but that's because I'm just so interested in what you're saying. I think uh, we're going to hear a lot more from our next panelist about a lot of the impacts about this, but I am reminded in what you just said that it took us from time immemorial to now to get what we have but it could go away in a matter of a minute or an instant. So it's incredibly important. On that note, I'd like to introduce Latasha Cafro of the Nisip, uh, Nisip, hmm, Nisipapi, sorry, Nisipapi Water Protectors. I'm sorry, Tash. Um, who is representing the Nisitipi land and water defenders uh, from traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Latasha, for those of you who don't know her, is a internationally recognized systems educator who is my colleague at Mount Royal University when she is not trying to save the world um, through her part of southwestern Alberta. Now, she also doesn't like it when I make her the center of attention, so I am going to give her a gift now and pass it over to her. Go ahead, Tash. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so, okay, Nisokwa, Nisto Anasta, Matamokamotsaki, Nin Anista, Onustam, Nistit Anista, Sakse Sanaki, Nax Anista, Agapiki Nafiaki, and my Mushroom and Kokomar, Willie and Shirley Oje. Um, my name, my English name is Latasha Kafrobe. My Blackfoot name is um, First Steels Woman. I come from the Blood Tribe of Southern Alberta, which is a member of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, as well as one of the signatories in Treaty Number no. 7. Um, so I was asked to come today to kind of share a First Nations perspective on the coal development projects that will be happening in the southern slopes of the Rocky Mountain. I think that it's really important to kind of acknowledge you know, the history of where some of these coal projects have come from and really the erasure of Indigenous voices um, both in the historic mines and in the current mining um, application process, uh, consultation process, and everything above. Um, the Grassy Mountain Coal Project itself, um, you know, part of it is located on a previously, um, previously mined area, and that was mined back in the 1940s and 1950s. And I think it's important to recognize that during that time and when those initial mines were active in, in these areas that Indigenous people were also removed from those conversations, that they were not consulted, they were not engaged, and quite honestly, they weren't even allowed to vote in federal elections at that point, which can kind of speak to how important Indigenous people were in the eyes of both the provincial and federal government and in the eyes of most um, Canadians. Um, and that continued legacy is carried on today. And so what I'll be really talking about in my slides is kind of what this would look like for Indigenous communities, the impacts that it might have on us and will have on us and kind of how those um, those impacts are 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 amplified in our communities and will be really detrimental not only to our health but our spirituality and who we are as Nitsitsipi people. Um, so Nitsitsipi Water Protectors is a really grassroots, um, I guess you could call us an organization, we're a small cohort of Blackfoot um, youth mostly 
who are fighting to protect our, our lands and our waters of, of where we come from. The Tsitsipi people have occupied these lands since time immemorial, and I'll get that to that in a little bit. Um, but more specifically, I think the impacts that the coal projects will have on First Nations people, um, if you can go to the next slide, um, you know, have been really missing from the conversation. And like I said, that there's, there's many impacts that coal mining will have on the general population and how these will be amplified in Indigenous communities um, is, it remains to be seen. Um, the air and water quality that these projects will have on First Nations, you know, it won't just impact First Nations, but it'll impact residents throughout Southern Alberta. Um, and when we look at health and wellness, um, specifically First Nations communities already face, um, you know, these insane health crisis, crises, is that how you say it correctly? We are already faced with large amounts of health crises in our communities and already do not have the proper infrastructure to accommodate to those health crises. And so with the developments of coal, we are going to see another part public health crisis in our community um, and multiple communities that we are not equipped to, to handle. Um, some of the issues that have been missing from this conversation also relate to safety of First Nations women. We know that in Canada, First Nations women are more likely to go missing or murdered than the average Canadian citizen. Um, and much of this is unfortunately at the hands of non-Indigenous people. Um, with the development of coal projects, there will be a huge influx of transient males who will come to the area to, you know, involve in these coal mining projects, which is the jobs that will be offered as part of development. Um, with that influx of, again, transient, most predominantly transient males who will come to the area, this poses a huge risk to the First Nations women and girls um, in the area of Treaty 7 who will be put further at risk, um, you know, coming in contact with, with these people. Um, it's also important to look at things like wildlife um, and, and plants and such in the area that um, Blackfoot people depend on um, and use both in traditional and spiritual senses as well as things like um, food, um, water, everything like that, as well as decreased livelihood. Um, but most importantly, I think, which I'll get to in a couple slides here, is, is some treaty rights. So if we go to our next slide, um, I want to speak a little bit about where the lines, mines will be located and really what this means for the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is, um, I, again, I'm from a community situated within the Blackfoot Confederacy. So our traditional lands in which our people have occupied since time immemorial range north of the north, um, range from the North Saskatchewan River down the slopes of the Rocky Mountain, um, all the way south to Yellowstone National Park area and then eastward into um, the Saskatchewan, um, what is now known as Saskatchewan. This is the place in which Blackfoot people, again, have occupied since time immemorial, long before European contact. Um, it is the place in which we, are, which we are born, in which our language, our culture has evolved from, and the area of land that we have protected um, long before European settlers have come to the area. Next slide, please. Um, the Tsitsipi people, like I said, have occupied this time since time immemorial and, and it is well documented of how we have used this land. It is also important to acknowledge that we have lived sustainably on this land um, prior to European settlement of the area. Um, things like how we contributed to not just um, human societies, but upholding natural law and protecting the spiritual integrity of water, mountains, and all creatures um, was the role of the Nitsitsipi people to, to protect these things and uphold natural law. Um, you know, when we look at Indigenous worldviews and from a Blackfoot worldview, there was no such thing as private ownership of land. Um, and we believed in collective ownership as we were all part of this land and it was our roles and responsibilities to protect it for our future generations. Um, you know, who we are as the Tsitsipi people is directly tied to these lands, like I have mentioned. We have creation stories of how this land came to be, of where we come from, and more importantly, of who we are today. Um, our past, our present, and our future is so dependent on this land. And really what it boils down to is healthy water equals healthy land, and that equals healthy communities. And our role right now is to protect these lands for our future generations. Um, it's important also to look at where we all kind of come together in this picture and where First Nations people have been removed from 
these conversations um, as well as, so next slide, please. So it's also important to look at things like treaty. And so in this area, we um, are, my, people from the blood tribe we were included in this in the signing of treaty number seven which is also known as the blackfoot treaty treaty number seven is ultimately what has created the rights for non-indigenous people to occupy this area it is because of these treaties that in which canada is born and unfortunately there is a long legacy of broken treaty promises and with the development of the, these mines this will continue that legacy of broken treaty promises um, with treaty there is a number of rights that were that were negotiated as part of those treaty agreements, including um, land to be set aside for First Nations use only. Those lands are known as reserved. Um, things like annuity payments, um, which are very small. You know, I still haven't gotten my five dollars this year because of COVID. Um, as well as other hunting and fishing rights um, in the area. Those are some to name a few. Um, again, there is a long legacy of broken treaty promises and with the impacts of these mines coming to the area, some of those rights that are protected by treaties, such as the right to fish and hunt, will no longer be um, accessible. Um, and our rights to practice and to fish and hunt in the area will no longer, we will no longer be able to do due to the impacts of these mines. Um, next slide, please. So our treaty territory is not the same as our traditional territories as they were um, kind of written into treaty, but this is the traditional, the Treaty 7 region and, and all that it includes. So where the mines will be located fall both within the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy and within the Treaty 7 region. And so with that, there is a duty to consult. Next slide, please. Um, so given the location and the scope of these mining projects, um, there is a duty for the governments of Canada and provincial governments to consult with First Nations as it pertains to um, development, especially when it um, any and related to natural resources and things of that matter. Um, so many people might be wondering, well, where do the letters of support come in and what does the duty to consult actually include? Um, it is important to recognize that the duty to consult um, is quite a stringent process and it does not um, really provide First Nations people the opportunity to intervene in the consultation process. It's that First Nations communities are often given two choices. One is to um, engage in the consultation process, which will provide them with kind of access to um, communications with the mining company itself. Um, or they can choose not to engage and both of which are taken as consent for the project um, that engaging in consultation however does not equate to community level um, consent and in most cases most first nations people have never even heard of these projects nor have they been meaningfully engaged in the consultation process um, this is also true for the 1976 coal policy that was mentioned earlier the rescinding of this policy um, was made without proper consultation in the Treaty 7 area and more so without consultation of other First Nations um, throughout Alberta. There you go. Um, so I, I mentioned a little bit about First Nations rights and when we look at these coal policies, uh, these coal policies and these incoming coal projects, um, they really are um, attacking Indigenous rights. And there are a few different rights that, such as treaty rights that I mentioned earlier, our inherent rights to the land um, and our Aboriginal title, which is reaffirmed, uh, affirmed and reaffirmed in some cases in section 35 of the constitution. Um, and so Indigenous, really where Indigenous people come into this, um, we do have large stakes in this. Like I said, we are part of the land and our spiritual connections to these lands. We do have a responsibility to responsibility to protect the lands in which we have resided since time immemorial. And through these genocidal policies and government structures, we are not able to actively engage in the consultation process um, in, in meaningful ways. If you go to the next slide. I'm almost done, Catherine. I see you popping up here. Um, so just to give you an overview of the regulatory hearing process, you can see that First Nations right from the get go are kind of separated from that process. Um, and this makes it really hard for First Nations communities to um, enter into the hearing process as interveners or as kind of key stakeholders, as well as we need to look at the context that First Nations currently um, exist in. 
we are constantly faced with external forces, um, are constantly underfunded, and are constantly just fighting for our rights to live and survive in what is the world. So being able to engage in these processes, such as regulatory hearing, requires large amounts of funds, and our First Nations communities remain continuously underfunded um, and overworked. So it is quite hard to engage in these processes, which require large amounts of legal fees, um, expertise, and support. Um, so being able to speak in panels like this is, is really great um, for First Nations people because we have been so removed um, from, from these processes and quite honestly erased from much of the conversation, both historically and contextually. Um, yeah, and so that's all I've got. <laughs> I assure everyone on the panel that is not all Tash has, and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, all right, so, um, just to make sure that we sort of address all of our panelists we're going to add, and so that we hear a lot of different perspectives this is a fantastic by the way opportunity to be part of a broader system and hear so many different voices um we have next rachel uh, herbert who is a rancher and author rachel herbert was born and raised in calgary alberta the great granddaughter of pioneer ranchers but a longtime vegetarian she returned to her roots and the family ranch near nansen alberta alongside her husband tyler she raises and direct markets grass-fed grass-finished beef uh, they are fourth generation raising the fifth to live play and work on the land at trails and ranch in the porcupine hills rachel holds an ma in history from the university of calgary and is the author of ranching women in southern alberta when she's not feeding cows or chasing kids or vice versa she can be found reading writing and advocating for the ranching west so i ask it also all now to turn our attention to rachel and i can't wait to hear what you have to say Thanks, Catherine, and thanks to everybody on your computers here joining us tonight. I'm so glad to finally get a chance to feel like I am doing something to help stop these minds, even if it's just speaking up with my concern, concerns and kind of preaching to the choir here tonight. So I was invited to speak from a rancher's perspective, but I feel like we are all so much more than just the industries we represent. For me as an individual, my concerns aren't just for the future of cattle ranching in the Livingston Range and downstream of these proposed mines, but my concerns stem from being a mom and an Albertan, and I want my kids to grow up healthy and to see this landscape stay intact for future generations. I've got a feeling in my bones. It's a love of the land, this place, that runs absolutely deep into my core, and I'm sure many of you here share that feeling with me. I'm rooted in the land. This place you see in the photos here, the open hills and the view west of the mountains, it's so much more than just the land where I run some cows and run my business. This is where I am truly at home. So where exactly is this place I call home? We are located, my husband and I and our kids, um, we live just south of Nanton, but we also have our, our land in the hills. It's in the first range of the Porcupine Hills, about 15 minutes west of Nanton. These hills, similar to this, run all along the range of the Livingston on those eastern slopes, and most of it's used primarily for grazing cattle by ranching families like ours. In this video, uh, in this photo I'm showing you here, we're on the highest point of land on the ranch and looking west towards the Livingston Range, you can see with the naked eye, the mountains just pop like right up in your face. But with my uh, smartphone camera, they look a little further away. But if you look to your screen kind of center left, you can see a long flat mountain and that is Plateau Mountain. And we can't see it, but just behind Plateau to the southwest is Cabin Ridge Mountain. And that is one of the sites of the proposed mines. And that's where the bulldozers are currently making all those new roads you saw in Katie's picture, making those roads right up into the Alpine and drilling test holes on the land that is important grazing land for a couple of our Nanton area ranchers. And these really significant changes to our mountains started happening before most of us even knew that the land was no longer protected. The coal exploration that's happening out there started just days after the UCP government rescinded the 1976 coal policy that had protected the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. 
This la lack of consultation is the basis for the legal challenge that will take the government to court through a judicial hearing in January. And it's in these mountains just west of the ranch that there are proposals for at least five open pit mines. And right now, as we speak, like Katie said, the government is in the process of selling off more coal leases that stretch from the Livingston Falls in the south all the way north through the MD of ranch lands across the road that we call the Gap Road and into the Kananaskis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my biggest environmental and economic concerns with the projects proposed and then I really look forward to the conversations and the details that we can bring up in the Q&A. You can go to the next slide please. So how are we affected those of us living and ranching along the eastern slopes? Well let's keep looking west here for a little while. I probably don't have to explain too much to you guys about this photo. Anyone who lives in southern Alberta is going to recognize that big old Chinook arch and you'll know what it means. It means wind. Our most reliable weather condition in this area is our wind. It usually blows hard and it usually blows straight from the west off those mountains. Our kids, Will and Avery, who you can see bringing up the cows in the rear of this photo here, learned from a young age that you better pull a hat down over your ears if you're going to work outside because you'll have the wind in your ears and be miserable all day and you'll risk a lecture from your mom. So as a parent, wind in my kids' ears is a little bit of a concern, but I have never once worried about the air quality that they breathe. In fact, I've always considered it a blessing that I'm raising my kids where the air is so pure. If open pit coal mines go into that range just west of us, I will be concerned about air quality. It doesn't take much research to know that the dust from coal mines bores airborne particulates and heavy metals that are known to have side effects for human health. You've probably all seen pictures of blackened coal mine towns and buildings, and you've heard the old fashioned term black lung. And we've talked about rates of asthma that are known in coal towns. Now imagine, that black dust blowing off of a Chinook wind. You could head to the next slide, please. So air quality is worrisome when you live somewhere where the wind never stops blowing, but water is life. If we let these coal mines go in, we risk irreparable damage to our headwaters. Whether we're talking about damage to water quality or quantity or both, there will be huge ramifications for everyone downstream. This is landowners, ranchers, farmers, irrigation districts. Actually, it's anyone who drinks from a well, a river, or a spring. And that's about 200,000 of us just here in the Old Men Watershed Basin where these mines are proposed. Now, the risk to our water supply that I'm talking about isn't just some hypothetical scare tactic. All we have to do is look across the mountain, not very far into BC, where tech mines have polluted the watershed so badly that threatened species of trout are showing up with deformities when the anglers catch them. There's legal action being taken by the US where the water flows into their jurisdiction, and the town of Sparwood has had to come up with a new supply of drinking water. And we've been hearing that some ranchers have to haul water to their cattle. It's estimated that by 2024, tech is going to spend $1 billion on water management to try to clean up their mess. As ranchers, we take our water seriously. We can't survive without it. We protect our riparian zones, we develop our springs and our water sources to prevent erosion and contamination. And even if we had all the grass in the world, water is the limiting factor in how we run our cattle. My worries about occasionally watering the cows from the creek when we don't have our offsite solar watering system set up seem pretty small in comparison to blasting the tops off the mountains in our headwaters and allowing that accumulation of heavy metals to poison everything downstream. In the photo that I'm showing you here, our daughter Avery and her horse Smarty are sharing a drink from a spring fed trough at the ranch. What you're looking at behind her is a really thirsty country. 
With limited rainfall in these big brown hills, we depend on the water that comes out of the mountains. I think one of the scariest things to have come out in all of the recent coal dealings is that the government has proposed taking away the water reserves in the upper Old Man watershed and selling them to the coal companies for industrial use. This is a massive policy shift and they are gambling with our most precious resource. You could switch to the next slide, please. So I've talked a little bit about some of my environmental concerns, but now let's think about the economics. When you weigh out the pros and cons of open pit mines over the life of a mine and beyond, they are simply bad business. The short-term economic gains do not outweigh the long-term damages of mountaintop removal mining. Right now, there is actually a $29 billion shortfall between the estimated liabilities of mining in Alberta and the money that is set aside in the Mine Financial Security Program, which is there for potential cleanup and damages. And we all know how well it's gone in Alberta trying to get oil companies to clean up their orphan wells, but I digress a little bit there. The government has made a monumental land use decision without us. By removing the protections along the mountains and encouraging coal investment at every turn without public consultation, they have essentially said that they are willing to trade the proven industries that work in synergy with the land and with each other, like the film industry, tourism, recreation and ranching, in favor of intensive non-renewable resource extraction, which is essentially an economic monoculture that will impact all of the other users and industries. My question is, if this is such a solid business decision, why is the government not making announcement, announcements and shouting it from the rooftops? Why has it taken all of us working from our homes and our kitchens and our ranches, digging behind the scenes through the paperwork to come up with this? Why has it taken good journalism to bring the mining propositions to public attention? Economically, there's two very different visions of land use for the Eastern Slopes. Metallurgical coal mining is part of a boom and bust cycle that is dependent on the vagaries of a global market and comes with a precedent for social and environmental damage. At a time where new technologies are emerging to cut down the use of coal for steelmaking and banks are moving away from investing in fossil fuels, why would we start to take down our mountains and pollute our water? Opening up these mines in some of our most important grazing lands will have immediate impact on ranchers and our cattle, as well as the wildlife who share the range with us, and we're already seeing these impacts in the exploration stage. Mining in the Livingston will affect ranchers in a few different ways. The loss of access to valuable grazing land, the permanent destruction of native grasslands, which are some of the most threatened ecosystems in Canada, and they are also virtually impossible to reclaim. There's the potential to introduce invasive weeds and species, and as we're seeing in the exploration stage already, these mines are bringing disturbance from dust, noise, roads, lights, and in increased traffic in an area that is already under intense pressures. You can switch to the next slide, please. We all know that we need economic re revitalization in Alberta. So why don't we look to the industries that have proven to be sustainable and adaptable over the long term? Let's use the ingenuity and entrepreneurial spirit that has characterized agriculture in Alberta for generations. My own family started in the cattle business in 1882 and we've been grazing leaseholders since 1890. And through the generations, we've relied on flexibility and working with our natural capital to keep the ranch going. After the depression, my great granny capitalized on the good scenery and ran a dude ranch at Trails End to pull the ranch through tough economic times. And today, Tyler and I have evolved the ranch into a direct marketing business for our beef. Ranching and other industries have the potential to be the ultimate in sustainable use of our eastern slopes. We work with the land because we know that the better we look after it, the better it looks after us. 
Ranching is just one of the industries in Alberta that has a history of stability, stewardship, communities who are committed to a long-term investment in place, and open pit coal mines in some of these most important mountain regions do not fit with that vision of my Alberta. When I think of our ranch and the future it includes, that's a place where my kids can still breathe the air coming straight off the mountains and drink the water that bubbles up out of the ground. I'm gonna want them to know that their dad and I worked to save the mountains. And with that, I'll close by saying that if you want to support the judicial review that is coming up in January, you can please visit the Save the Mountains site on Facebook and find the link there to contribute to the GoFundMe campaign. And maybe we could even put that up in the, the chat. But thanks. Thank you, Rachel. That is both an incredibly beautiful presentation and an incredibly important reminder to all of us that even though we come at this from different angles and from different backgrounds, we all share the deep commitment to making sure there's an Alberta for our children and grandchildren that can support them in the kinds of things that we value and that can support them biologically, socially, and economically. So thank you so much for sharing and sharing those beautiful photos of what looks like such a permanent space, but is actually so fragile. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna invite our very last panelist uh, to come and speak now. So Tana Boonlert is from Protect Our Waters Calgary. Tana is one of the founders. Uh, Tana is one of the founding members to Protect Our Waters uh, Calgary chapter. This are Winters. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. and he moved from Calgary to Calgary in 2013 from Ottawa to be closer to the mountains and to be a strong voice for climate change advocacy. Um, Th Tana is an avid snowboarder, mountain scrambler, and a commissioned photographer. He has a background in environmental engineering and is currently working as a greenhouse gas uh, specialist, helping large industrial emitters find ways to reduce their emissions while also generating revenue. Wow. Uh, passion for the outdoors has led his ambitions to finding solutions for protecting the environment while still allowing advent, uh, adventure enthusiasts to enjoy nature sustainably. So Tana from Protect Our Winters, Calgary, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks so much. And hey, you know what? I'm trying to protect our waters too. So it, it, it's, you're definitely not wrong here. <laughs> um, first of all, I definitely want to acknowledge all the amazing people that I see online here in the, in the attendees list. A, a lot of big names that I didn't realize would be on this call. And um, I feel somewhat inadequate uh, speaking about such a such an important subject here in Alberta. But you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best here and I'm going to keep it a little bit lighthearted because I, the issue that I'm, I wanted to touch on today is about the recreation side of things and how we actually enjoy the outdoor space and how we all share it together. So um, yeah, let's go to the next slide here, please. All right, so um, I also want to say that uh, a lot of the things that I will be sharing with you guys today and talking about uh, was not given to me directly from Protector Winters. Um, I, I am one of the co-founders here in uh, for the Calgary chapter for Protector Winters, um, but I'm, I'm just a volunteer at the same time. And a lot of the things I'll be talking about are my personal views as how they relate to the Protector Winters vision and mission, and also some of my experiences that I think you guys would uh, find interesting relating to uh, the coal developments here in Alberta. So next slide, please. Awesome. So just briefly here, in case um, you're not too familiar with Protector Winters Canada, it did originally start in the U.S., uh, where it's actually really big there. Uh, started by Jeremy Jones, and uh, they, they are really great at advocating for climate change issues uh, to the federal government there. And uh, we've kind of adopted a similar uh, model here in Canada. And the mission is, I'll read, the, I promise you this will be one of the only things I read here for you. So the mission is, our mission is to turn passionate outdoor people into effective climate advocates. We believe our love of adventure in nature demands our participation in the fight to save and protect it. Um, we, we talk a lot about climate issues uh, within Protect Our Winters, but uh, a lot also has to do, of course, with protecting the land that we use and the, the land that we all partake in when doing these outdoor activities, right? So the footprint that we have is also a huge concern for us. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So a little bit about myself. Um, my background is in environmental engineering and currently my nine to five job is uh, as a greenhouse gas specialist. 
Um, I've been really fortunate to, 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 to work in this space, but to also work with large emitters and, and helping them reduce their emissions, right? And finding solutions, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we could be, we could be activists and you know what, I do, I do consider myself an activist to a certain degree. And, but at the same time, I think we need to work with a lot of these guys who are, are um, the polluters and uh, finding the solutions to, to help get to where we need. Because at the end of the day, I think we, we're trying to find that balance. We're trying to grow an economy, but we're trying to also provide jobs. Um, also, you know what, let's go to the next slide here. Yes. So uh, a big passion of mine as well uh, is, of course, the outdoors. Um, as uh, Catherine said in uh, my biography there, I'm a photographer. I'm a commissioned photographer. Uh, any chance I get to go outside, I'm, I'm there. Um, on the weekends, we're always in the mountains trying to do, summon a new mountain or going camping, going snowboarding, anything that has to do with that. Uh, th this is a picture not where uh, the mines are proposed, but this is actually in Canmore uh, on Grover Mountain recently. Um, and I, I strongly believe that my interest in the outdoors has, and, and being outdoors a lot more, has led me to wanting to protect it. And I think as, as more people go outside and enjoy the outdoors, they, they start to find the values in, in that. And I think the more people we get outdoors and, and trying to reconnect with earth, the more people would want to protect it as well, right? And, and I think this is a large goal of Protect Our Winters is trying to connect the dots for people when they go outside that, hey, you know, the space that we're using here that we're sharing together and having fun is also the space that we need to protect because otherwise we won't have this in the future to play outside with. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, yeah, so, a lot of people do know me for my environmental uh, work and advocacy around town. Uh, I, do, I do do a lot of stuff outdoors, but I, I would also encourage everyone who cares about these issues to, to, to show up to the rallies um, when possible. Uh, obviously, not, maybe not during a pandemic and right beside each other like I am there in the picture. But um, if you care about these issues, it's really important to, to stand up and to be there because the numbers in voices is everything. Um, I think a, lot, a large reason why uh, these mine projects get to kind of go sneakily under and really fast is that the general public don't know about these things. And, um, and a lot of us people who care about these aren't showing up to whether it be rallies or aren't writing the letters to their, uh, to their MLAs or to their MPs. And we really need to start doing that if we, if we truly do care about these things and we don't want them to go forward. So uh, next, please. Right. And um, <laughs> before I touch on this, I do want to also mention that, that uh, everything I'm talking about here, I, I'm coming from a point of, of major, major privilege, right? I get to enjoy the outdoors. I get to do photography, snowboard, um, because I've been lucky enough to, to, to find work uh, to get an education and uh, to have parents that supported me through that education as well. So I recognize my privilege when, when talking about this and that not everyone gets to enjoy this. Um, right, so let's talk about coal really quickly here. This is why we're here. Um, I believe so far on the panelists, I may be the only one who's actually worked up at the coal mines. <laughs> um, and right here, this picture here that you see on the left, uh, I'm actually on top of a building, and you see their scars in the mountain for, from which they've dug up uh, the side of the mountain to, to get to the coal. This is actually it in, I'm trying not to reveal the name of the company, but it is near the Sparwood region. Um, I used to do quite a bit of work in the coal mines uh, as an air emission specialist, uh, doing the testing for the air quality that, that was around there but also the, the air loss coming right from the processing facilities. And um, these, these mines that I were at, which were several, several of them that I went to quite frequently, these were for met metallurgic coal. So open pit mining for metallurgic coal. And again, I reiterate that it's for steel making, right? And um, it's kind of funny that the government is framing this type of coal mining as clean coal. And as you can tell by my face there, <laughs> 
I'm not very clean. <laughs> um, and this is just from a few hours uh, of work. And, uh, you know, I, I was wearing a mask here as I, I normally did, it, it, in, especially inside the buildings, one of the particulate filtering masks. And I can tell you still, even with, with wearing a mask, the particulate would go through those masks. And by the time I went back to the showers, I'd be blowing my nose and there'd be black stuff coming out every single night, no matter what. And it was really hard to get the, the cold dust out, off my face, off my hands, and it'd be stuck on me for quite some time. Um, so you could just imagine the type of quality, the health quality that a lot of these workers are, are, are having to undergo from working there day in and day out. Um, and I just threw a li in a little fun thing here. We were so dirty this one day coming back from the mine site and going into uh, a bar to grab a drink with our coworkers. Uh, they, were, they had an award going on for the dirtiest coal miners and they would win the Rocky Miners of the Year. Our team, some for some reason, were the dirtiest and we won. <laughs> um, I do also want to quickly elaborate on this experience because I also want to talk about how how much I learned from the people actually working there. You know, a lot of the people that work there don't actually say that, hey, I, I love coal. You know, coal is my life. I, I do this for my entire life. This is just something that they felt they had to do in order to feed their families, uh, to put food on the table, right? And and just as their livelihood. And you know, I I don't I don't blame them. And uh, it was it was kind of heartbreaking talking to some of the people there who actually lived in the area were close to the coal mines. And them saying that in the summer times, uh, you know, when they're in their backyard, they'd look on, you know, the tables that were outside or their chairs and it'd be full of coal dust. And that's just from their, their lawn chairs, whatever sitting there th throughout the days. So as you can tell, yes, let, let, me, let me give some context. Yes, even in the cities around there, they, they do monitor the particulate matters, but it only has to meet a certain, a certain threshold, right? Um, there's still a lot of particulate in the air. And I can tell you just from my experience of being there and talking to people, they're, they're still breathing a lot of this stuff. All right, so next please. Right, so uh, in the spirit of the holidays, <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 there, there's a lot of fear around this time and a lot of anger towards this government and I understand, but I, I do want to just at least celebrate one win even if it's not on, on them, but hey, you know, coal power, at least, they're saying now might retire by 2023, seven, seven years ahead of schedule, right? This is, this is a great win. Super, super amazing. Uh, it's not all on them. It, it, it's on everyone. And it's just not economically uh, competitive anymore. And that's just the state of the affairs, right? When new technology comes on board, that is when innovation starts. And then that's when we can make things more economically feasible. And I'm hoping that's the way that we can go even with steel making. All right, next please. Sadly though, within the same week and actually the same day that that recent article was released, this article also came out a few hours later stating that more coal leases um, were gonna be offered to, for, for coal mining, right? And um, that's the part that hurts a lot. And I'll chat about that in some next slides here. Awesome. Okay, so I want to touch specifically more so on uh, the coal mining areas here close to uh, or in the Livingstone public land use area, right? So if you're not familiar with that area specifically, that, that public land use zone, so it's everything kind of north from uh, the Crow's Nest Pass, uh, uh, from Col Coleman, Blairmore, and then north, pretty far down. So as the article said, and, and you guys have talked about, it, it's, it's a large, large area all the way up to the Old Man River. Um, and I wanna talk about this area because this is an area that I spent a lot of time uh, this summer in, uh, adventuring and uh, just camping, hiking, whatever else. So for some perspective here, you see Crow's Nest Mountain there, and then Thunder Mountain right behind it, Old Man River is right there. And a lot of these uh, proposed coal mine sites are all around these iconic areas. And I think if, if there are some listeners out there that, that are frequent hikers or summiters, you, you know, that Crow's Nest Mountain is such an iconic mountain uh, that I'm sure you've seen even just driving on the Crow's Nest uh, Pass. 
And, um, you know, the sad part is that all around that area now could be all coal mine sites. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's actually a really popular road that we take uh, going towards Crow's Nest Mountain and the Seven Sister Mountains there. And where we do a lot of camping and exploring and whatnot. And there's really cool uh, lakes even that I'll show you guys later um, that have the potential to be contaminated by a lot of the coal dust and also the heavy trucking traffic that would be consumed by, uh, by these coal mines. And one thing that I'll also mention before I go to the next slides here and talk about some of the adventures is that, uh, remember too, that this coal has to be transported out somehow, right? And uh, from my experience working at the other coal mines is that they had several different train lines running through the coal mines in order to get that coal out and then to market. So remember that as well, that there's gonna be increased traffic, which will affect the habitats around there and local people being able to explore around there. Next, please. Right. Um, yeah, so th these are, I'm just going to show you some of the pictures that I've taken here from some summit tops that kind of show the areas of where are going to be affected. This is on top of Turtle Mountain. And as you can see, that big mountain right dead center there, that's Crow's Nest Mountain. And the town right below, um, uh oh, <laughs> I believe that's. Coleman and uh, and Blair Moore beyond there. Um, and if you see, it, it's all green there and, and, you know, lush forests and the mountains. Those are all the areas or a lot of it is where the, the mine proposals will be. So it's, it's quite sad. Next, please. That's me on top of uh, Table Mountain, which is also really close to Turtle Mountain. And again, the landscape behind there is uh, more proposed areas that would be developed. Next again. Oh, next, please. Perfect. Um, this is one of the iconic areas that I was kind of talking about before. Crow's Nest Mountain right there in the middle. Uh, oh, Seven Sisters on the left. It's okay. And um, Sure, that's totally fine. It, can you click on that video there? That That's uh, the water video? If not, it's no big deal. But I just wanted to highlight too there that even within the, that, those areas where they're developing coal, there's these awesome kind of hidden lakes that are just absolutely majestic that are going to be affected by some of these developments um, that a lot of people actually wouldn't even get a chance to see. But a lot of animals depend on these areas as well, right? and uh, there's camping involved there. And it, it would just be extremely sad to see a lot of these go. Next one, please. I'm trying to hurry up so we can have time for questions. Perfect. And this one is on top of the uh, Crow's Nest Mountain, the iconic one I was talking about. And you can see the mountain range there that it looks pristine at the moment that will also potentially be affected. Um, Again, this is a lot of this area is public land use in the Livingstone area where a lot of people camp and what they call free camp uh, or random camp, sorry. But one thing I wanted to point out as well, it, it's not just adventurers like myself that do summit top uh, things, but in these areas, you get a lot of um, uh, ATVers, uh, four, -wheel uh, four wheelers and um, motocross type people that use the areas. And I, I would assume that they would also be really disappointed for these uh, areas to be gone. So next, please. Right, okay, I'm gonna hurry up here. Um, you know, during the pandemic time, of course, uh, a lot of us felt alone, but I think that loneliness and just the time not being able to, to spend indoors forced people outside. And as you can tell by these articles here, just even written in the past few months, outdoor gear has been selling like crazy throughout the, the, the few months here. People are getting outside. People are finally getting the chance to reconnect with the outdoors and appreciate the outdoors. And I really think that this increase in people getting out is, is going to, to get people to want to protect it. Um, a little quote here that I found awesome from Mech. There was this pent up desire for people to get outside. And I totally agree here. So I'm hoping people want to protect. Let's move on to the next real quick. 
closing remarks. Perfect. Okay. So, <laughs> um, what I quickly just wanted to say here, I think it's time to move on from old technologies, right? I think this, this old mentality of being all in on resource extraction is what's leading us to this boom bust economy like Rachel was talking about. But also, if you look at the history of Coleman and Blairmore, they were bo booming cities at the beginning. And now you look at them, you know, there's barely anybody there. I would rather see Alberta move into uh, the idea of innovation, being, being leaders in change, being leaders in, in, in where the puck is moving to, not where it is at the moment. And uh, the last, last thing I promise I will say um, is that I, th I think we need to start really investing into alternatives for steel making. Um, but also investing heavily in the innovation for steel recycling. And I think having doing that will hopefully create more jobs uh, for the, the province, but also make us leaders. So thanks for listening, guys. Wow, Tana, that's a very powerful and positive way to end this conversation. So thank you. I apologize. I hope that my little video, video pop-up isn't too stressful. I'm being a terrible moderator because I haven't left any time for questions. But I hope that the 205 participants will forgive me for taking a little bit of the liberty here, but we have about 13 minutes left of your time. So what I would like to do is sort of, I've been reading through the questions and they're very interesting. They're very good, they're very specific, which speaks I think to the passion of the people on this call. So I'm gonna ask kind of a meta question that I've pulled out from both a lot of your different presentations as well as the questions here. There's a lot of interest um, in the questions around what people can actually do. And there has been a number of you have brought up the idea of consultation or lack thereof. And so as a way to set up the way I know that we want to end this conversation, I would like to hear from each of the panelists kind of some maybe a high level lessons learned that you have taken from being involved in the change making process, whether that's on the political side, the socio-ecological side, or within industry itself, so that when we talk about what we can do next, we learn from what we have already done. So I'd like to hear from each of the panelists. I have no preferred order, but if you make me, I will call on you. And I've got some experience being a professor, uh, so I'm happy to exercise that power. But you know, we've heard from industry, we've heard from ranching, we've heard from sort of indigenous perspective, and we've heard from also biological perspective. Uh, perspective. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to hear those high level lesson learned from what you've, as you've tried to make change, what do you think it's important for our participants to hear? So I can ask you to go, um, or you can volunteer. Volunteering is much easier. Uh, so I'm just gonna see who turns off their microphone first. And if no one does, in the next 10 seconds, I will call on someone. Thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna jump in, and I'm a student from way back. I can do this. Um, I think what I've learned through this process is people keep asking, what can we do? Putting in the comment threads, what can we do? And it's the same thing that all of us who are engaged in this fight keep asking ourselves. Um, the pandemic has been a really interesting time to try to make any noise, especially on something that's environmental and can just kind of get waved away as another, you know, environmentalist or worried about something again. Um, but I think what I've learned is just We've got power if we all just work from our kitchen tables. Um, we're really seeing just we're at the early stages of getting momentum, getting public awareness. And I think that if everybody can just push themselves a little bit, you know, write that letter, like Tana said, it's hard to get people to even just write a letter, but just get activated and we're gonna make some noise. So I think awesome. we need it, we need the government level here. So write to your politicians right away. Just don't let, let them know that we know what's going on. Well, and we're in quarantine now, so we should have a little bit of time. Uh, Latasha, uh, Katie, or Tana, who wants to go next? Go ahead, Tash. I can go next, just to follow up on Rachel. I kind of have four really high level, I guess, and one is following Rachel is, is get educated. Um, you know, there's so much information out there, both online and speaking to people, you know, I've only entered into this, I, quite honestly, I only learned about the Grassy Mountain Coal Project about five or six weeks ago now, and have since then that learning curve has gone substantially, um, so that <laughs> has gone very, that learning curve has been exponential, that's the right word, um, and some of that has just been by blind calling people, um, 
I, the first time that I got in contact with CPAWS was actually, I called their automated line and was like, I kind of care about this and I don't know what to do. And I have no information on what this means. Um, and a lovely lady phoned me back and kind of provided information. So there's many ways to get informed about what is happening and many people who are willing to share that knowledge with you, that it's not as hidden as we might think it is. Um, the other action item I have is to get involved and show up. I know that's hard in a pandemic, you know, but when there's people rallying and there's so much power in numbers and that when we stand unified it does make a difference both with indigenous and non-indigenous communities and how that looks from ranchers to farmers to indigenous people that there is power in numbers and you know there's power in standing in solidarity um, the third one that I have is to honor our treaties like some of the things that I have mentioned um, you know by honoring our treaty rights both as indigenous and non-indigenous people and upholding those treaties we are in turn protecting the land and the water and the animals and all of these various things that people have talked about um, and those are kind of embedded into those treaties and that when we all stand behind those such wonderful things can happen um, and then fourth would be kind of use your privilege in whatever that looks like for you. Um, you know, as a young Indigenous woman, I'm all often quite at the bottom of these social hierarchies. Um, but it has been leaning on people who might be able to open those doors a little bit quicker to get access to people or politicians or MLAs or chief and council or whatever that looks like. You know, I'm, you know, was privileged enough to be able to go to educate, to, to go to post-secondary and get an education. And I'm now using that to help inform my community of what is happening and what, you know, creating community awareness campaigns and such. So those are four kind of, you know, get educated, get involved and show up, honor the treaties and use your privilege. Um, so whoever's next. Thanks, Tash. Uh, Katie or Tana? Whichever would, one would like to follow that. I can keep mine real quick here. I, I say two things. Um, if you're not sure if you should do something or not yet, maybe that passion's not quite there for you. So the first thing that I'd recommend doing is, is go outdoors, you know, uh, re rediscover why you should be outside and be connected with nature in general. Climb, you know, climb that first mountaintop, summit for the first time. It changes your life, it really does. Secondly, um, raise your voice and i think cpos has done an awesome job especially in, in the uh, the whole protect or defend alberta parks campaign if, if you see from where they started to now you see those lawn signs everywhere to, so much to the point now that the current government um, did a rebuttal campaign called our parks will go on which is really funny um in, in a lot of sense but i think i think that effort also shows that they're listening once they hear you but they won't do anything unless they hear you. So get out there and raise your voices. Thank you, Tana. Uh, Katie. Yeah, I don't know that I have too much more to add to all of that um, amazing inspiration. Um, but you know, just yeah, take an action and talk to people and spread the word. I think uh, we sometimes also get in these bubbles that we're working on it, and all the people we know are working on it, and um, and then you go people you know, talk to someone who doesn't have their head in the coal mine world every day. And they're like, what? I, I don't know anything about this. Um, so talking to people and, and really taking those actions directly with your elected representatives. Um, I know it's really easy to sign things like petitions um, on change.org or something. Um, and that's fine, but don't just do that. Make sure you are writing, meeting with your, your elected representatives. And I saw um, a note from one of the MD counselors that is on that reminded us to not just your provincial and federal elected representatives, but your your uh, municipal or, or band council, as Latasha is working on, all levels of government um, need to know that you're concerned about this, how this affects um, you and, and the values of the landscape. Absolutely, Katie. Water and air don't respect political jurisdiction. And I think that's pretty clear. Um, I do want to just apologize to the to all of the participants that we weren't able to go through the questions in detail. Um, the conversation was so interesting that it, it just made a lot more sense to focus on the panelists, but that doesn't mean your questions aren't 
super valuable and super important. Uh, and so I believe when I pass things back over to CPAWS, they'll talk a little bit about what's going to happen going forward. But before I do, um, I want to extend my sincere thanks to our four amazing panelists, uh, Tana, Rachel, Tash, and Katie, for uh, just giving us not just their time and their insight, but also demonstrating their passion and their commitment to our shared future in this province. And that means so much as not just a, a recent transplant, uh, five years, so Tana's a little bit uh, more established in Alberta than I am, but nothing like Rachel or Tash, um, who've been here, of course, a very long time, but also thinking forward and thinking about what kind of Alberta we want to build in the years after the pandemic. These kinds of conversations, as I said, are absolutely crucial. So I once again, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for sharing um, your passion, your ideas, your experiences with us. This is, this is the kind of invaluable social um, connection that will help us build that kind of province that we want. So thank you so much. I'm going to pass things back over uh, to Becky with uh, CPAWS and she will hopefully wrap us up in a way that um, really makes us ready to, to address what needs to be done. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Catherine, for your wonderful moderation and all the panelists is really amazing. And thank you to all the attendees. I, I'm like super uh, surprised every time to see people dedicate more of their life to sitting in front of a screen. And I'm so amazed that you're not totally burnt out at that you're willing to have these important conversations with us. It's really inspiring to see. Um, yeah, and to just echo what Catherine said. Uh, we're seeing so many like amazing ideas in the chat and the Q&A about other ways people can take action and we had so many questions, a little, some of them very specific. Um, so we will make an effort, the CPAWS team, to uh, get a blog post out and address all these questions and combine, uh, compile some of the ideas and links that people are dropping in the chat so all the participants can see it. I have a little list of things and I dropped them in the chat as well of resources you can look at right now. Um, so the first is Albertans for Coal Free Southwest, which is a partnership between uh, CPAWS and the Livingston Landowners Group. You can find a letter writing tool there, um, lots of resources to help you learn more about the issue, also a donation tool to help us in our legal interventions. Um, I dropped the Nitsitapi Water Protectors Facebook page in the chat, check them out. Latasha is always putting out awesome content and calls to action. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, the Pekisco Group's legal fund can be found at savethemountains.ca. Um, Protect Our Winters is hosting a film screening tomorrow to celebrate International Mountain Day, which is December 11th, uh, and they'll be screening the film Purple Mountains. Um, Council of Canadians Calgary Chapter is have a, having a letter writing event uh, this Sunday that's focused on coal, uh, and they will be sending letters to the Federal Minister of the Environment, Jonathan Wilkinson. So I recommend that you join them for that. I think you can find uh, that information on their Facebook page. Um, but yeah, that's all we have. Um, please stay tuned for the follow-ups and we'll get to all your questions. I don't know how quick we can be with it. We do, we might need a bit of a break, Christmas break. So we will try to get it out as soon as we can. Um, but yeah, I just wanna thank everybody for tuning in tonight and all our amazing panelists. Um, we really appreciate having everybody, all of you online with us. Thanks very much, everybody.